My name is Mike, if we haven't met. There's a lot of Mikes around here. Um, my name is Mike Hall, and if we haven't met, I've worked here, worked here since the spring of 2014 as basically the youth pastor. And uh, this is my last month on staff, and this is my last time getting to share something with you. Whew. Here's my question. What would you find more meaningful for you? Don't, immediately we start thinking about, well, I wish she was here because she needs to hear this. Okay, listen, listen, listen. I know, I know. You're thinking about your friend, you're thinking about your aunt, whoever. This is you, okay? You. You. What do you find more meaningful? To live a life that feels useful or to live a life that feels useless? It's, it's just like a dumb question. I know. You're like, duh. Like, uh, would I rather eat gravel or eat pizza? Well, duh. I know. It's kind of a duh question. Of course we want to feel useful. Of course we do. Well, here's the question, question, question. You ready? You ready? You ready for this question? How do you feel useful? Like, does it just happen by accident? Nope. The way you feel useful is to do useful things. <laughs> it's just not complicated. That's the only ingredient to an end result of usefulness. I feel useful because I do useful things. Now, in life, there is action and there is reaction. Action and reaction. Some of the things we're doing because we are the ones making it happen, and some, t some of the things that happen in life, we're the ones just reacting to something else that's happening. Make sense? You know, I think this is super, super easy. And you can either go through life hoping that useful opportunities will be handed to you and handed to you, and handed to you. You know what? You need a useful opportunity. Here's one. Or you can go get them. Well, no one gave me a chance to get in the game, and no one, to, no one, no one, well, I don't want, I, don't, I was a lacrosse coach once, and I saw a kid stay after practice for an hour while we all cleaned up the field. The next game, I let him start the game. He wasn't even very good but I let him start because he proved to me that he wanted to be useful. He stayed after and worked on his own, running, throwing the ball against the wall for an hour all by himself. And I said, you, sir, get to start the next game. He took an opportunity instead of just waiting. Well, coach won't put me in the game. Make sense? One of the most useful things you will ever do ever, ever, ever in your life is to be a mentor to someone else. One of the most useful things you will ever do. Now, some of these are very short mentoring type of situations. They could be one minute where you show someone else that doesn't know how to do the thing how to do the thing. You show someone else who doesn't know how to be the thing how to be the thing. And some of them can be decades long mentoring relationships. There has been a few of us that have invested into Nick along the way. Uh, Kev and Doug, his leaders, and then Kip, who used to work here, Trey, me, have invested in Nick, as well as dad and older brother. And now Nick is a remix leader for seventh grade boys. Really awesome to see. Really awesome to see. You know what that is? Usefulness. Usefulness. Moses chose to be active when it came to feeling useful and being a mentor to a guy named Joshua. And those are the two main guys we're going to look at today, Moses and Joshua, and their connection with each other. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, we're going, to be, we're going to be starting in Exodus chapter 17, all the way toward the beginning, Genesis, Exodus, second book in the Bible, starting at Exodus 17. We'll also have it up on the screen. But if you are the kind of person that wants to turn there, then turn there. If you've got a phone and you want to pull up your Bible app, 
Turn there. Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 13. Let's see what this says. The Amalekites, those people, Owen, those people were sus, all right? You do not want to mess with the Amalekites. You don't even want to be an Amalekite. That is not your goal, okay? They were sketchy, uh, mean, nasty people. They came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Come, uh, no, sorry, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Next. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. He went beast mode on them Amalekites. Sorry about it. You got God on your side. You're going to lose. That happened in 1446 B.C., by the way. Isn't that crazy that we know that? Uh, But that's when it went down. So many people, I feel, in our culture, you probably feel this too, have lost sight of the, the crucial aspect of just living life together. Together. No one really, I think, wakes up in the morning and says, today when I go to bed, let me just have the most lonely day ever. I want to be invited to nothing. I want to have no plans this, this weekend. Even though everyone else seems to have all these plans, I want no plans. I just want to be alone. Now, so, okay, introverts, listen. I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about that kind of alone, like you're exhausted by social situations. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying we were created to be together. And you see the value in just that short passage we just read with the Israelites fighting the Amalekites. Moses says, I got you. You go out and fight. I got you. I'm going to hold up my, my staff that God gave me that I know is miraculous because it parted the dang Red Sea. I don't know if you saw that, Joshua, but this staff is a big deal, and I'm going to hold it up. Well, I don't know. Have you ever tried to hold something up for a long time? It's tiring, okay? It's tiring. Like, I'm tired now. I am not in good shape. All right, but he's holding up the stick, and he's like, I'm getting tired. Joshua, keep, can you please whoop him? Uh, hurry, because my arms are dying right now. Uh, and then so squad comes next to him on his left and the right. They're like, we got you, and they hold up his arms, and they give him a rock to sit on. He's like, thank goodness, because my dogs were barking, and I'm trying to hold up this stick. And appreciate you. You see the value of community happening. Together. We're better together. Social media is a horrible substitute for real life togetherness. Real life togetherness. Let's keep going. If you want to see the value of mentoring in the Bible summed up in one verse. Anybody seen the movie Inception? Inception. You've seen the movie Inception. Three of us have watched that movie. Shame on you. Okay, there's a lot more. Okay, Inception, amazing movie about going into a dream and then into a dream and then to a dream inside the dream. Anyway, let's look at 2 Timothy 2.2. What does this say? The things you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What? That's four layers of mentoring in one verse. You think the Bible thinks it's a big deal? Well, of course, because it puts mentorception into one verse. The things you've heard from me, well, now you, you go train you, and then you go tell other people. Four layers of mentoring. That's awesome. It is one of the most mental, uh, mental, not, it, sometimes it feels mental. Uh, one of the most useful things you will ever do in your entire life. And although the Bible does not use the words mentor, mentee, or mentoring, it frequently refers to what we believe are successful mentoring relationships. 
For example, you got Jesus and his disciples mentoring. You got Barnabas and Paul, Paul and Timothy, Naomi and Ruth, Elijah and Elisha, Moses and Joshua, Deborah and Barak, Elizabeth and Mary, many, many others. All are powerful examples of pairs and the God-inspired action they took to help each other develop. Everybody with me? This is cool. This is what we were built for. Well, I don't feel that useful. Here you go. (laughs) By the time you walk out of here, you got no excuse of how to feel useful. You got to do useful things. This is just one of the most amazing, useful things you can do with your life is to be a, a mentor to someone else. Moses and Joshua illustrated successful mentoring partnership. Now here's we're gonna we're gonna do some fill-ins at the at the end. You're gonna write them down. You're gonna take a screenshot. You're gonna do something to capture this. So you take this with you at the end. But we're gonna we're gonna go through some scriptures and look at see how Moses and Joshua are developing this relationship. Even though they don't sit down and say, "Will you be my mentor?" And Moses says, "Sure." I don't know why he doesn't talk like that at all. Um, <laughs> sure. Okay. He doesn't do that. He says, "Yes, I will be your mentor." All right. But we're going to look at some things that actually went down, and then we're going to summarize at the very end. You ready? The first thing he did uh, was he gave him, he delegated, delegated, not gave him, delegated, a very, very important stretch task, something that kind of stretched him. He made him in charge of the army. Now look at this verse right here, Exodus 17, 9. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men. Now, whoa, 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 whoa. Did he say, Moses, if it wouldn't be too much, maybe you could, I don't don't know, sort of find some, uh, maybe some people, I don't know, kind of some guys to fight. No. He looks straight into his face. He goes, go get some dudes. We got to fight. Amalekites are sketcho. We need to take them down, and you need to get some. Sometimes mentoring is like that, where you just get all up in their face, not in a mean way, but as a delegation. You say, we got a, we got a problem to solve here. You do that. You do that. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to hold up the stick. You go fight. He gave him a task. He delegated it right to him, very specifically to him. He opened the way for their ongoing teamwork. And this is the first time that this mentor asked someone else to lead an attack. One of the many, many times that his mentee, Joshua, would command an army based on Moses saying, you go do it. It's pretty cool. Did they sit down and negotiate uh, the developing relationship? Probably not. They just went with it. It's more likely uh, that Moses wasn't cognizant of applying mentoring principles and didn't necessarily view Joshua as a mentee, but you see what's happening. Following this successful assignment, Joshua became a frequent companion of Moses. It's not hit and run mentoring. It, you become locked and like connected, linked. Check this out. Moses, no, uh, no, 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 not next one, next one. Uh, Exodus 24, 13. Then Moses set out with Joshua, his aide, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. So Joshua was technically like a servant, but like an aide, you could, you could like switch that around and say servant, but, but we see that he's kind of growing out of that, even though that's like on paper, a servant, but he's becoming more of like a colleague more of like evil, uh, even playing field almost, which is pretty amazing to see how much Moses starts trusting him. Uh, he was actually more of a colleague. Uh, Joshua refused to leave with Moses. Exodus thirty-three eleven. Look at this. Exodus thirty-three eleven. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. This is not something that a servant would be able to decide. 
He's like, I ain't leaving here. This place is amazing. You go on, Moses. I'm going to chill here. This is not something that a servant would have been able to do. They would have had to go where their master went, so to speak. So here's what's cool. Their uh, mentoring relationship deepened, and Joshua gained valuable knowledge, skills, and confidence. We find evidence that their mutual trust increased when Moses allowed his mentee to accompany him to an important meeting with none other than God Almighty. Hey, I got a meeting later. With who? Your boss? No. Well, kind of. It's God. Wait, wait, what? Yeah, I got a meeting with God later. It's in my day timer. Sorry, that one's for the old people. Um, (laughs) I've got a meeting with God. We're not sure that Joshua was actually with Moses in the presence of the Lord, but we know for certain that he was on the mountain. Exodus 32, 17. Exodus 32, 17. Let's see what this says. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. We know for certain that he was on the mountain and talked with Moses on their return to the camp. Imagine the incredible lessons Joshua had with Moses. The things that he learned that day, because Moses invited him to a key meeting, and this is what we do with people we mentor, whether that's at work whether that's on your lacrosse team, whether that's on your soccer team, whether that's uh, with your cousin. This is, this is applied to any area of life where you are connected to someone that is not as far along in whatever area it is. Specifically today, we're talking about the area of faith developing. But any human being, you can apply this. With who? Your friend's little sister, who's five... That's younger than you, right? Yeah. You can apply this too. You don't have to be an old head to apply this to your life. Moses took Joshua to another meeting in a special tent where Moses spoke with God again. Joshua chose to stay in the tent after Moses left to return to camp. Joshua remained, this is Exodus 33, 11, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. But his young aide, Joshua, did not leave the tent. This is another time where Joshua says, I'm going to hang out. You go on. I want to stay here. This is amazing. This is incredible. I'm I'm in the, the very presence of God Almighty. And this is overwhelming and this is incredible. And Moses says, all right. Here's the question. Who can you, who can you, 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 who can you introduce into the presence of God? Who can you introduce into the presence of God? Well, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't, I don't know. Well, ask. Ask. When we ask God for bread, he does not give us a snake or a stone. He gives us, especially if it's something that lines up with with this book here, he wants us to share. He wants us to mentor. He wants us to be involved with each other. So say, God, please give me opportunities. I'm, I'm ready. I'm nervous. I'm scared. I'm anxious, but I'm ready. I want, because I know that I want my life to feel useful. I want it. Moses continued to offer Joshua opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, and finally Moses affirmed his mentee by commissioning Joshua in the presence of the people. He gave Joshua public recognition for the lessons he learned. Even more, Moses gave power to his mentee and handed his position to him. Full-on handoff, you lead the people of Israel. Their formal mentoring relationship ended. When Moses died, Joshua was appointed as the new leader of Israel and later took his people into the promised land. 
Moses provided a great lesson in how to transfer leadership. Sometimes we transfer it to the next in line. Sometimes we release them to go lead somewhere else. Make sense? Sometimes we release them to go lead somewhere else, and sometimes we hand the baton, which is what I'm about to do here at Lake Forest. Pass the baton to the next person. Let's look. I need everyone to have something to write with, to write on, or to type, or to take a picture, but I'm just going to wait, and I'm watching. Will, do you want to help me? You want to walk up and... Will's going to be my security? Everyone has something to write, because I don't want you in a week to say, like, what'd that dude say at church? I don't even remember. Hey, give me another Bojangle biscuit. I can't remember what he said. No, you're not going to have that conversation, because you're going to, oh, yeah, that's right. I wrote it down. Okay, here we go. You ready? You ready? Here we go. We're going to fill in the blank. This will be fun. This will go quick, and then we'll be done. Uh, Blank, the mentee, preliminary stretch task. A sign. A sign. A sign them. Mostly in school, when you get an assignment, it's not optional, is it? Teacher, do we have to turn it? Yes. Assign them. Preliminary stretch tasks. Next one, depending on the mentee's initial performance, making additional assignments requiring more skills and responsibility. They start to build on each other. Inviting them to key events. We saw that happen with Moses and Joshua meeting with God. Allowing the mentee to observe the mentor in action. Affirming the mentee for achievements. And then stepping aside to let the mentee succeed. Leave that up there just for one second. And then I'm going to land the plane. You're welcome, Trey. There is nothing more useful you will ever do in your life than mentoring. And you can right now be thinking, be thinking, who is it that is already in my life? Who is it that is already in my life? The new neighbor who just moved in three doors down. You're like, duh. I could totally mentor them. Duh, my cousin. Duh, my friend's little sister. Duh. Like, sometimes we just ask God, God, show me. And he's like, they're right in front of you. And you're like, oh, them? Wait, wait, them? And he goes, "Uh uh-huh. You're like, eee. He's like, that's why I told you I would be with you. Because if it's easy, it's probably not worth it. You want to feel useful? You got to do useful things. Jesus, the ultimate useful moment, dying on the cross for our sins. Ultimate. Nothing will ever touch that. Let that be your example. Was it easy? He said, if any way, God, you can take this from me, I would like for there to be another solution to saving these people and forgiving them. But Not my will, but yours be done. I know this won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. And at the end of my life, at the end of the day, I would say my life feels useful. Let me pray. Thank you, God, for this amazing time today. Thank you for my sweet, sweet, awesome, incredible friends in this room. I'm really grateful for everyone being